Today's episode of the Essential Oil Revolution is brought to you by freeoilcourse.com. If you're new to essential oils, then you definitely want to check out this free oil course because especially today's episode is going to dive into some more advanced techniques and advanced knowledge regarding essential oils. Today's episode is all about chemistry and essential oils, so I don't want you guys to get intimidated if this is your first episode or you're kind of new to essential oils. So definitely go check out freeoilcourse.com so you can get just the basic foundations of how to use essential oils safely and effectively. Again, that's freeoilcourse.com. Not doing more than the average is what keeps the average down. William M. Winans empowerment and education two powerful elements that will help you break free of convention and transform your passion for wellness to a level beyond the status quo the essential oil revolution where you're given the tools to supersede an ordinary everyday lifestyle inspiring speakers diy recipes healthy living tips and more you'll discover it all here so tune in and get ready for a wellness revolution for show notes and more, go to revolutionoils.com slash podcast. Hi, I'm Samantha Lee Wright, and you're listening to the Essential Oil Revolution. This is the place to go to for essential oil knowledge, education, and healthy living tips. Today's episode, I'm super excited to bring you Laura Hopkins, who actually provided the quote for this episode. I always start each podcast episode out with a favorite quote that might relate to the episode. And uh, when I interview a guest, they ha- I have them send me a bio. And that quote actually came from Laura's bio. So I don't always read bios, but I wanted to read Laura's because I just think it's super great. So she says, not doing more than the average is what keeps the average down. Since memorizing this quote in high school, it has been Laura's mantra. Her positive outlook and intense determination to never give up are two skills she's developed over the years to encourage herself and others to choose to thrive in life. Formerly a corporate communicator for a top-tier energy company, Laura discovered Young Living Essential Oils in 2006 after the birth of her first child. She soon immersed herself in learning about and using the oils on anyone or anything who would stand still. In 2009, she began pursuing Young Living as a business. Her husband, Jonathan, left his full-time job in June 2014, and together they reached the rank of Diamond in 2015. They travel around the world, educating others about wellness, purpose, and abundance, as well as share with others through the blog, thriveincity.com. Because of her passion for education, Laura co-authored the book, Nutrition 101, Choose Life, and has worked on several other projects, including books like Gentle Babies and Road to Royal. Today's episode, we are going to talk all about chemistry and essential oils. Now, Laura is not a chemist, but she is an educator, and so she teaches on this topic very frequently and makes it very accessible for everyone. So if this is your first introduction to chemistry and essential oils, you're in for a really great beginner's guide. She does a fantastic job breaking it all down in very easily digestible little chunks for us. So you're going to love this episode. It's going to really enhance your knowledge of essential oils and how just incredibly wonderful these little oil bottles are and what they can do for our bodies. So enjoy the show, but first let's pull a recipe out of our DIY dugout. Today's DIY recipe comes from me. I wanted to share a really great cooling blend that you can use because summer's here and it's getting hot and I thought everyone needed a little cool down. So the next time you need to cool down, just throw these essential oils into your diffuser. Three drops peppermint, three drops spearmint, and two drops eucalyptus oil. Enjoy. If you'd like to submit your own recipe to the DIY dugout, please email us at revolutionoilspodcast at gmail.com with your name, your recipe, and your website if you'd like to include it. Thanks. So, hi, Laura. Welcome to the show. I'm happy you're here. 
Thank you, Samantha. Yes, I'm excited. It's kind of funny that you asked me to speak about chemistry because I, I think um, I'm just from a lay, from a layman's term. It was something that I was interested in, but if I had ever been voted most likely to teach chemistry in high school, that wouldn't have been me. I would have been least likely to teach <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> well, that's perfect. We're speaking layman to layman on this, which I think <laughs> is where we need to start because it is such an in-depth topic and yeah, we could go on forever. So, but first I just want to say congratulations on retiring your husband just a few short years ago. What an incredible journey you must have been on. Are you both working on the Young Living business together and, and what's that like? Yes, actually, um, he doesn't technically, I've, I call him retired sometimes, but technically he doesn't like to to use that term. He says he's on sabbatical from his teaching career, but we've really enjoyed the last two years of, of working together. It's probably been two of the toughest years of our 18 years of marriage, but um, it's been great because it's brought us back. We've had the privilege of being able to work together, set our own schedule. He's actually in Europe right now, um, helping t- with one of our teams that's growing over there. And so it's it's just wonderful to be able to have the freedom to set your own schedule. We're working probably harder than we ever have. And we have a lot of projects outside of Young Living that are going on, but at least we're able to pick and choose and we're not tied down to a nine to five schedule anymore. Or as I would say with when he was a coach, it was more like a a six to 12 schedule. He was always at the school, always working all, all year round. So it's been great. Oh, well, congratulations. That's just so fantastic. And now also just one more question before we get into chemistry is I noticed that you helped write the Road to Royal book by Deborah Rayburn, which is just one of my favorites. I've got it on my shelf right over here. And anytime I have, you know, one of my members that wants to learn more about creating an income with Young Living. And I say, you have to read Road to Royals. So do you want to just explain a little bit about that book and and what was it like to work with Deborah on that? Sure. Well, Deborah is um, the very first class I ever went to in Houston, uh, Texas, when we lived there was Deborah Rayburn taught it. It was an ancient oils of scripture class. And she's in my upline. I have between she and I, there's Um, several diamonds that are are also family and friends. And she has been really very integral in my in my journey with the Young Living with Essential Oils as as several of those others were as well. And we first came together to work on the Gentle Babies book. And then we started there have been several projects since then and Road to Oil was something that she's Kind, it's kind of morphed over the years. Um, originally, several years ago, it was a, a different model she called Step Up to Success. And um, I really like what she's put together. I I really kind of am her her feedback, her editor, if you will, on on putting the information together and kind of putting it in a in order. She's really been integral. Of course, she's a Royal Crown Diamond, so she knows the road to Royal. Yeah. <laughs> she's traveled it and knows it well. And so she's kind of blazed a trail for all of us. And I, I really believe the model that she's set up with education and and the way that she talks about pushing through and not giving up and, you know, just really giving some pretty basic, simple steps and continuing to say, you know, this is what you do. Continue to do it over and over and over again until you reach your goals. Awesome. Laura, well, can you know, I would love to hear how you started on your journey with Young Living and how that led you to become sort of this lay person's teacher about chemistry and essential oils. Well, sure. Um, it was, my daughter was four months old when I started with Young Living and she was, had been born premature and I thought I was doing everything I needed to through my pregnancy and, and things. I'd worked with a midwife and I really had no clue, honestly. I'm um, looking back on it now, you know, you think ignorance is bliss, but at the time it wasn't. And I was so grateful to come across Young Living at that time. And I really was confused that, you know, like a lot of new moms, I wanted to do the very, very best, but I was hearing a lot of voices and I was hearing a lot of people telling me, do this, do that. And so when I found Young Living, I, it really kind of became something. I started using the oils. I started using the the household cleaners and the thieves and the products. And it was almost like my mom confidence level just really solidified. It wasn't something that I felt like it was a challenge. I felt like it was it just essential using essential oils was just very simple and easy. It wasn't overcomplicated, probably also because I had some really great mentors and teachers like Deborah Rayburn and Sarah Johnson and Karen Hopkins and Karen Douglas and learning from a lot of different leaders out there. And I think that that was a big part of 
my continued use is because it wasn't overcomplicated in the beginning. And so using oils, when you see it work, when you see the oils and products from Young Living work with an infant, and there's no placebo effect with a baby. It either works or it doesn't. Right. <laughs> same thing with my little, we have, uh, you know, had a little dog too. And you see the oils work so well with animals and babies. And so you just, it just built a confidence that really just kind of was solidified in those, that first year. And I really was the product user for a very long time, not really getting into the business aspect of Young Living for quite a while, but it just was a very natural thing. And, you know, Young Living always says wellness, purpose, and abundance. And that very much was, for me, a key to my success was making sure, focusing on wellness, focusing on my family's wellness, having our own personal experiences and stories that really solidified why we use the oils. And I always tell people, even if I wasn't leader in Young Living or wasn't receiving a commission, I would still use these products because I believe so much in them and, and I believe in the seed to sell process. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting that you started out using the oils on, on your infant or your newborn, which I think a lot of people that are unfamiliar with this territory would sort of go, ooh, is that safe? And is that <laughs> is that part of what led you into learning more about the chemistry or the more advanced side of Young Living? It actually was. I, I went to, I went and learned from uh, Dr. David Stewart at a CARE which stands for the Center for Aromatherapy Research and Education. And it's really, a lot of people think of CARE as just raindrop training, but you get about eight hours of chemistry. You learn raindrop, you learn emotional release, you learn a lot of things. And what I think I took home the most for me was when you look at the chemistry, when you understand the chemistry of oils and how they work so well with our bodies. I mean, when you think about it on a chemical level, our bodies and essential oils really have a lot of the same substances, a lot of the same chemicals. And when we talk about chemicals, most people think, oh, those are chemicals are toxic, but so many natural chemicals that are compounds that are occurring in our bodies, occurring in the oils, are just so harmonious. And so for me, when I started, it was a light bulb moment because clearly, you know, if I used something and it worked, it was great. And I would look through books and understand how to use it with my infant. And of course, gentle babies was a huge help with that. And, and understanding and learning from Deborah of her several decades of using the oils with children and babies and pregnant moms, but the chemistry most definitely helped me point to why I had confidence. I had confidence because I used it and I saw it work, but then for people who needed an explanation of, is it safe? Absolutely. I was able to, to say, well, here's chemically what these oils do. And here's how they interact with the chemistry of your own body. Now, chemistry was not my favorite subject ever (laughs) in high school. I think it was probably my worst subject ever. I just could not get into it. It was just like gibberish in one ear and out the other. So for me, when I see, you know, chemistry and essential oils, I go, Ugh, I don't want to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that if I was to know a little bit more about it, I feel like it would really enhance my experience as a user. Um, you know, what would you say to other people like me who hear chemistry and just tune out? I think it's keeping it simple. It's not, you're not having to, there's not going to be a test at the end of this call. This is really understanding the why. And so the thing with chemistry, if you, I like acronyms. I like to keep things simple. I like to make sure that, that, you know, as I'm learning, I, I keep it in bite-sized quantities for people. Um, and those who want to get more in depth, there are so many people that I have, have been to my chemistry classes that know way more about chemistry than me, way more about scientific explanation of things and the processes. I just kind of start somewhere and take it a little bit at a time. And so for someone who feels overwhelmed by it, there's really, if I can learn it, you can learn it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm the yeah. same way with chemistry. That was not my forte at all. But I, I also have decided that I want to learn. I, w- I never want to stop learning and I never want to get in a place where I feel like, oh, I, I can't learn something. So I always, you know, one of the ULA things is setting goals and learning new things. So in my ULA field, that's one of my goal is stepping outside and learning new things. And so I can be 
put on my Ula field. I put on my brain power. I put on frankincense and uh, vetiver and I open up my books and, and start understanding how those oils are helping me learn chemistry. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I love that. We actually interviewed the Ula guys all the way back in episode number three. So for those unfamiliar with uh, Ula and what that means, highly recommend episode number three. So Laura, where do you usually start in your classes? You say you start somewhere. Uh, where do you start? Well, for me, one of the fun things that I love about teaching chemistry, like I said earlier, was acronyms. And so just basically breaking it down and I talk about what chemistry is. And so chemistry is really the study of substances and how they undergo change and how they have an effect. And we're talking about just chemistry as a broad spectrum. But when you look at some people think about the, the scientific or the periodic table. When we look at that periodic table, I say, you know, there's only five things that an essential oil will contain from that periodic table. And it's an acronym that you can do chosen. It's C-H-O-S-N. And that's carbon and hydrogen. So carbo- hydrocarbons is, is basically all essential oils will have carbon and hydrogen. Some will have oxygen. Most will have oxygen. Some will have sulfur and a few will have nitrogen, but all have hydrocarbons, the carbon and hydrogen. And so if you think of chosen, that kind of breaks it down into what they're all going to have. So C-H-O-S-N, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen. And so whenever you look at that and you start thinking, okay, you know, the periodic table, it makes it it's like, oh, this is real science. This is not just some woohoo voodoo thing (laughs) out there. It's real. And so when you look at the chemistry of an oil, you say, okay, what does it not have? So this is what it has and what does it not have? And so a lot of people think about using oils and fasting and cleansing and things like that, but oils do not have vitamins. Oils do not have minerals. They're not going to be nutrient providing for you. So you need to still eat food unless you are cleansing or fasting or going through those periodic times where you do that. But essential oils do not have proteins either. And so proteins, a lot of times people, it's like, why would that matter? Well, it's a protein is typically what you're, when you have an allergic reaction to something, that's what you're responding to is the protein. So a lavender plant, a lavender, if you had a stalk of lavender that you had growing and you cut off a sprig, that has proteins in it because those proteins are in the plant material itself. When an essential oil, when that plant material is taken to the distillery, it's heated up, the steam in there um, creates the necessary action for the oil to be released from the plant. It's the right temperature, it's the right pressure in the distillery that creates the right combination and then that plant releases the oil. Now the oil is very lightweight, very lightweight molecules. They say 500 atomic mass unit or lighter. Actually, in order for to leave, it has to be very lightweight. Proteins are heavier than that. Proteins are heavier than 500 atomic mass unit. So as the essential oil is in the distillery and it's be, the steam is released and it's going out and the, the steam and the oils rise up, they leave through the condenser and come down through the separator, but that plant material stays in the, in the still. It stays in the hydro chamber where everything, all the plant material is. And so the peptides, the proteins are too heavy of molecules to go out with the oil. So very simply, it's there's no proteins in it. So when people say, well, I'm allergic to that oil, chemically speaking, from an atomic mass unit perspective, there's it's really not possible if the oil was steam distilled properly and the right way. If you have like a fatty oil, like a fatty oils are your carrier oils, anything that you would dilute. Like we use V6, which is six different vegetable oils, but there's coconut oil, olive oil, almond oil, you know, avocado oil. Those are fatty oils. Their molecules are much bigger. They're heavier. And so they're not in the same molecular structure as an essential oil. And so whenever we talk about maybe an infused oil. So if you take that same sprig of lavender and put it into a pure fatty oil or a carrier oil, that's going to have proteins in it because the plant material is present. But when you have a properly distilled essential oil, then you're not going to have proteins present. So essential oils do not have vitamins or minerals. They don't have proteins. And you know, they don't have hormones. I've seen studies before that talk about how oils will create I saw one study that talked about how it affected uh, boys and created, caused boys to have breasts. Well, first of all, you have to go back and look at the study. You have to see what they're talking about, what other factors were at play, obesity, genetics, 
diet, those types of things, exercise, even the area where the people that were studied live. But honestly, if there's no hormone, there's no hormones in that plant. In fact, Young Living has lots of different essential oils that of course can be very supportive for the endocrine system that can be supportive for a healthy hormonal system, but they're not going to have hormones in them. The only difference is when we look at something like a progestins plus or a supplement where progestins plus does have progesterone in it, that is a hormone, but the single oils and the blends that, that are specifically essential oils are not going to have hormones. That's just, it's not in there. So that's really what's in an essential oil. Um, those molecules are what's in, and then those, the vitamins, the minerals, the proteins, the hormones are not in essential oil. So that really, I think that's the best explanation I've ever heard of what is the difference between essential oils and other forms of plant medicine, such as teas or tinctures. So like if you were to make a tea, like a chamomile tea, that's going to contain like the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the proteins, which is great. People should still drink their tea if they're trying to get that stuff out of the plant. But essential oils does not contain any of that. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. And and so it just depends on, of course, which herb you're using, but the tea is most definitely going to be, it's more, it's the herb. So it's going to have, it's the full spectrum. So it's not just the oil of that tea. And with an herb, the difference, a lot of times people say, well, I can just take the herbs versus the oil. And there's a lot of similarities, of course, because, you know, it's the oil comes from the plant, but it, like you said, there's no proteins in the oil. There's no vitamins and minerals, but one of the great benefits of having a tea, they can, a lot of times a tea can create a different experience than an oil would. The other thing with the teas and the herbs is they are going to have a shelf life that's much shorter. And of course, when you use an herb, when you use a tea, you want to get the maximum value is the freshest, the better, because most herbs are 75 to hundred percent dead. I mean, they're going through that process of of they've given up their life and you're using the leaves, um, you're using what they have. But a lot of times the oil is also going to be leaving that plant as well. So anyways, when you talk about, yes, when you talk about an herb, that is true. Okay. So besides the shelf life, what would be the advantages of using an essential oil over a dried herb? Well, the essential oil is much more concentrated. So a lot of times I've heard different statistics, but like, let's take peppermint, for example, peppermint tea, in order to get the same chemical constituent of one drop of peppermint oil, it would take about 26 cups of peppermint tea. It's just so much more concentrated. The oil is, you don't need as much oil. So you could take a drop of peppermint and put it into put it, add it to something, add it to hot water um, with lemon. And, and that can have a great effect as well. There's some chemical changes that people, that the oils can undergo when they're heated. But when you think about overall though, when an oil is heated, it's heated to fairly high extremes whenever it's actually being distilled. So chemically from a molecular structure, it's not going to be a significant change, but I just prefer when I use my oils, I don't want to heat them that much. So if I'm going to be putting them in a tea, I want to drink the tea, you know, fairly quickly once it's cool enough for me to drink. But the, but the tea itself is very relaxing and it's great, but the oils just, it's just a lot more concentrated. You just don't have to use as much. When you do the tea, it's all of that plant but when you do the essential oils, it's really a concentrated version of like the complete chemical profile is kind of how I've heard it explained. Does that make sense to you? It's a great way to, to uh, phrase it. Mm-hmm. So then I, I understand that there's different categories. I'm not sure if that's the right word for it, of essential oils like terpenes, esters, sesquiterpenes. Can you touch on that and explain that in layman's terms? Okay, sure. There's really, when we talk about, yeah, those are all different kinds of categories, but there actually are three main classes of chemical components. Dr. Stewart, he taught this in his chemistry classes, and he's written some books that are great that help explain it as well. But the three main chemical classes, actually, it's another acronym. I know you love that. (laughs) Yes. It's PMS, or technically it's PSM, but you won't forget PMS, right? Right. (laughs) Um, So PMS, so it's the phenylpropanoids. It's the sesquiterpenes and monoterpenes. And those are the three main classes. And then additional categories will come from that, from those three main classes. And when you look at those three main classes, it's going to 
break down and, and explain the action of the oils. So you can look into different books and see, okay, this book contains, or this oil contains 40% phenylpropanoids. It might have 10% sesquiterpenes or, you know, whatever it, can, it, it it varies. And some oils, but all oils are going to have a combination of those classes. Some have at least, you know, most have, will have two, a few have all three, but the, every single oil is going to have at least one of those classes represented in their chemical makeup. And so the phenylpropanoids, just briefly, there's a lot that can go into this, but the phenylpropanoids are compounds of carbon ring molecules. So basically their job is to go to the outside of the cell and to clean the receptor site. So um, I like to always kind of talk about phenylpropanoids in relation to like a, a rusty lock. So you might have the right key that goes into that lock, but if it's rusted, if it's, if it's got a bunch of buildup on the outside of it, that key's not going to work. And so the phenylpropanoids job is basically to de-rust or de-oxidize. We talk about antioxidants are good foods that we want to eat. Antioxidants help with de-rusting our bodies as well. So phenylpropanoids have that property, have that ability to do that. So their job is to go to the outside and to clean it off. Um, so when we think about what kind of, you know, we think about our locks and our bodies and keys, well, those receptor sites are waiting for the right hormones or waiting for the right keys to come up to them and open the receptor site so the cell can receive usually the glucose from the sugar from our blood after we've eaten and get the energy that it needs. So when if oil comes up, uh, excuse me, a phenol, an oil containing phenylpropanoid is used, it can actually have the ability to clean off the outside of those receptor cells. And people think, well, what's a receptor cell junked with? Well, why would it get oxidized? Well, there's a lot of things in our environment. There's a lot of things in our in our bodies and, and that we personally choose to take and, and, and enter into our bodies. There's other things in our environment in addition to emotions and feelings that can junk up our cells. So phenylpropanoids do a really good job of, of preparing the outside of that cell. What's an example of, of a high phenylpropanoid oil? Unfortunately, because of of some government regulations, I can't make a connection for you. Oh, I can't right. tell you a phenylpropanoid and what oils have those, but um, there's some really great books out there that have usually most guides that most of my friends are familiar with. They can go out. Some of my favorite publishers are like Life Science Publishing is, is a good one or Sound Concepts, and they provide books that will break it down and tell you the, the percentages of those different chemical compounds in an oil. Sorry, I, I think I interrupted you. You were going to talk a little more about that. Sure. Well, that's, so an example of a phenylpropanoid. So for example, a person who is, is diabetic, um, a person with diabetes, their, their cells, their receptor sites have to, are waiting for insulin to come up and unlock the receptor sites. And the insulin's job is to unlock it. So then the sugar, the glucose can go into the cell and the cell can get what it needs to have, you know, the food. So people who are diabetic, a lot of times they'll eat and then they have not much longer than they feel the urge to eat again because their cells are starving. And so that it creates a problem because the insulin is not able to do its job. And some people have, there's theories out there that, well, their people are insulin resistant. One of the theories, another theory out there is that that the receptor sites are gunked up. And if the receptor sites could be cleaned off, then the insulin can actually the body should be producing insulin. And if it is, then they'll know quickly because the insulin can then unlock those cells and then the blood sugar will go down because the glucose goes directly into the cell. So that's an example of the proper action of a hormone in the body being able to be used in from a cellular perspective. But the phenylpropanoid's job is not to get the glucose into the cell or to unlock the, the phenylpropanoid's job is to just clean off the cell. So the body's system, so the body's chemicals can do what they need to do. Yeah. I love that. Something Gary always says is if you feed the body what it needs, it will take care of itself. So I feel like essential oils are such a, a beautiful way to feed the body what it needs to, so we can kind of get out of our own way and let the body do its job. And the the example that you just gave is just one example out of thousands and thousands of bodily processes, probably millions of, of these hormone exchanges and, and energy exchanges and communication exchanges that are happening in our body every second of the day. Absolutely. I mean, the way our bodies are so 
fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, it's fascinating when you look at the the chemistry of, of our body and everything that has to happen. People just sitting there breathing, you're sleeping and there's there's things that are happening. You're thinking and there's enzymes that have to be used. I mean, it's just, and there's two real main, you know, communication channels. It's it's the email, which is your your nervous system. When you touch something, it's hot. We touch something, it's sharp. You immediately, it's, it's instant. But chemically, you know, that moves a little slower and there's a chain process that has to go. That's more of your snail mail or your FedEx system or the delivery, you know, the delivery system. And that's where the oils work so well in the chemical process because they contain their, their chemical structure is similar to, you know, the way that our chemical makeup is in our bodies as well. So that's phenylpropanoids. Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. That's correct. And do you have time to quickly explain monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes and the difference between those? Sure. So the mono, uh, the sesquiterpenes, and I said PMS, but it is PSM. So sesquiterpenes, <laughs> actually their job is to help with delivery of oxygen. The one cool thing about sesquiterpenes is that they, you know, we talk about infamous miscommunication or misinformation, but what's in our cells is our blueprints, our DNA. And so one of the cool things about sesquiterpenes is that they have the ability to go in to, to help rewrite code, actually erase or deprogram wrong coding, not rewrite it, but deprogram the wrong coding in the, in that memory. So you have memory, every single one of your cells has, they estimate, you know, they're still learning about the human body, estimate about eight gigabytes of memory in each cell. And you have about, you know, give or take a hundred trillion cells in your body. Wow. So you've got a lot of memory in your body. <laughs> so wow. there's clearly opportunity for wrong information to be in there and wrong memories, wrong storage. And when you say memory, you're not just referring to like our childhood memories. Do you want no. to explain that in more detail? Sure. Sure, exactly. So when I talk about memory, I'm talking about what's written on with the things that that make up you, the things that make up your cellular makeup. And that's part of your code that's inside your cell, your DNA. And so when you look at that, that's memory that's stored for your cells to be able to have the job, their, their blueprint, their plan of action of what their job is, what their assignment is. And so whenever we talk about memory and we can relate it to a computer somewhat, so a computer, if there's a virus on a computer, if there's a problem, you have to a lot of times strip it out and go back and you have to delete everything off first. And so the sesquiterpenes job is to go in to, if there's wrong information, sesquiterpenes job is to erase that wrong information. One of the cool things about this is oils that are high in sesquiterpenes we know can cross the blood brain barrier. And that's a very fascinating thing for science because most pharmaceuticals goal is to be able to cross the blood brain barrier. Um, the blood brain barrier is a protection to protect our brain, our nervous system, but sesquiterpenes have been proven to be able to cross that. And so in order for, for something to cross the blood brain barrier, it has to be between less than 800 or about a, a thousand atomic mass units. So it has to be very, very small molecular weight. And what did I say earlier? The weight of an essential oil after it's been distilled is 500 typically or less. Yeah. So whenever we talk about crossing the blood-brain barrier and those sesquiterpenes, that would right there prove <laughs> that, you know, we know sesquiterpenes can cross, but from a scientific standpoint, I guess we're waiting to see additional research. You know, everyone wants third double blind studies and all that kind of stuff. But the cool thing about the atomic mass unit to cross the blood-brain barrier, it encompasses the atomic mass, mass unit of an essential oil. So the sesquiterpenes right. now are doing that. It's a huge deal. It's, I mean, if you were to talk to any doctor or nurse and say, oh yeah, essential oils can cross the blood bank barrier, they're going to go, what, really? And it, it, it's just, I was listening to this episode on one of my favorite podcasts called uh, Radio Lab, and it was an episode about bubbles. And some scientists have created this machine that creates these very, very tiny, tiny microscopic bubbles. And it's this, you know, huge machine, probably costs millions of dollars to create, and it shoots this targeted laser beam of bubbles, basically two parts of the brain for patients that have tumors and things like that. Or I was just sitting there listening to the episode and going, wow, that seems really complicated. I can just slap some essential oils high in sesquiterpenes <laughs> on my body and it does the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, even the ability to cross the blood, uh, the brain tissue is, is so important. 
for our body's health. And Dr. Stewart talks about even being lipid soluble. So being fat soluble is another key in being able to cross through brain tissue. Water soluble um, molecules usually don't penetrate into brain tissue. And so when you think about that, because oils are fat, they're the lipids, they can be small. They're small enough to pass. The atomic mass unit is small, plus they're lipid soluble. So there's an, there's so many things that are working for essential oils when it comes to working, uh, going across the blood brain barrier. And that's another benefit of our Young Living supplements is because in addition to having some great vitamins and minerals, they're fat soluble because they carry those oils in them. So that's something that actually sets the Young Living products, the supplements apart is having essential oils in the supplements. So again, you're getting your essential oils when you're, you're using them topically, you're inhaling them, uh, your dietary oils, you're ingesting, but also when you're taking your supplements, that's also a great benefit for your body as well. I've always found that really interesting about the supplements and the link between that and having that fatty oil to help it assimilate in the body. Really fascinating. Okay. So then monoterpenes is the last one, right? Absolutely. So monoterpenes. So most essential oils um, have monoterpenes. What monoterpenes primary job is basically when we talked about the sesquiterpenes to erase or deprogram the wrong information, the monoterpenes job is to go in and restore the right information. I like to stay to um, kind of reset it to the manufacturer's specifications. So whenever you have a computer that you pulled all of the wrong information off of the wrong viruses, you, you have to restart. You have to reload all the right information. You have to go back and put in your right softwares and reload everything up. And so that's something that the monoterpenes will do. They estimate there's about 2,000 varieties of monoterpenes. So there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of fluctuation in how those monoterpenes can be different categories, as you will, of monoterpenes. Okay. Well, that's a great, easy explanation. I like that. I just want to pause here and give a nod to our sponsors at freeoilcourse.com. So if you're brand new to essential oils, this episode might be a bit overwhelming for you. So be sure to check out the free three-part video series that teaches you the foundations of how to use essential oils at freeoilcourse.com. I would love to, if we have time, do you have time to talk a little bit about chemistry playing a role in the production of essential oils? And and when you look at an authentic essential oil versus a synthetic essential oil, how can we tell the difference and what does that mean? What's so amazing about the seed to seal process is that we really get the opportunity to control and see it from start to finish. So it all goes back to, you know, the seed of the seed of the plant. It's 100% non-genetically modified. It's going to be a seed that we're using a lot of times, you know, we look at our seeds. They were seeds that originated from previous harvest. You know, the seeds from that are growing of lavender in Mona, Utah and up in Idaho were seeds that were brought from France. And you know, a few years ago whenever there was that major drought and virus that most of France was wiped out by the lavender production. And now we were able to bring that same seed back to France and partner, have that consortium with so many lavender growers there in France and has made us, you know, one of the largest grower of pure lavender in the world. So chemistry starts at a very basic level, non-genetically modified, making sure that that seed, that that's pure. And then talking about the soil and the chemistry of the soil. One of my favorite stories about Ecuador when Gary Young started down there was how he went in and he planted corn, heirloom corn, because he wanted to get the soil right. So he had some of the workers and the people there from locally, and this is of course before the, the school was completed, but the Young Living Academy, but he had workers, they came in, they got the corn, they could use it for themselves, they could sell it, whatever. And Gary took the stalks and he plowed them back under to get the pH balance, to get the chemistry of the soil right. And so, you know, that's, when you look at that, it's so important how that soil, that seed is nurtured and how that seed is nourished. So we have, we have greenhouses at all of our farms. We have the farm in Ecuador where they're experimenting with composting with goat manure. We also, again, composting whenever the, the plant material is taken out of the distillery and you have, we only do first distillation. 
that plant material is taken out, put into compost bins, and it's it's put back into the earth. So even after the, the plant has given up its oil, it's used back in the soil. So all of that goes into a very harmonious um, structure, a foundation for what that, that seed is exposed to. And then also the chemistry, when you look at our, like a, a harvest time, what they do is take brick testing with our herbal farms. They'll go out and they'll test, basically it's like testing the blood sugar, if you will, of a plant. And they'll see when the oil is the, the highest predominance because Young Living's been doing this for over you know 22 years. And so they look at, there's, there's a library of information that they've tested where they've gone out and harvested at different times. And is the chemistry right in this plant that we can harvest it now? When are we going to get the most production out? And so they start whenever their numbers are right. And then they take testing throughout the day. The temperature has to be correct. You know, there's, there's humidity to be considered. There's lots of factors that go into proper harvesting. And then whenever it's those, it falls out of that favorable time, they stop. They're not just harvesting from dawn up to dawn down or to sunset. They're waiting for the right chemistry of that because they want to get the maximum amount out of that plant. And then taking it down to the same thing is for like our conifer farm up in Highland Flats. When I've gone to winter harvest before, really is best. It's, it's not convenient for people or machinery to be harvesting in, up in northern Idaho in winter, but the, it's the best time to get the oil out of the trees. And it's the oil is in the roots. It goes, when it gets, as the temperature drops, it goes up into the tree and then they can cut the trees down. They chip the trees and then they distill the chips. So it's really all about understanding the chemistry of the actual plants. And so many plants are different. For example, sandalwood that I just visited last week at our sandalwood, our partner farm, uh, the plantation there in, in, uh, on the big island in Hawaii, those trees, actually the oil accumulates in the roots. So it's understanding the chemistry and what's happening with that plant to be able to get the maximum amount out. So then it goes through the distillation process. It actually has different temperatures, different times for every plant. It's amazing to understand this, just the time and the energy and the, the years and years of research that Gary Young and so many of his scientists and his teams have put into maximizing the time that the harvest because we understand this is nature's living energy. We don't take it lightly and we're not going to, we want to get the most out of it. So it's really great to whenever they go through the distillation process to get the maximum amount out. So we're not wasting time. We're not wasting resources and we're getting the most from those plants. So that the chemistry of the plants is really important, but it, it gets seed to seal. It's all the way through through distillation, making sure, you know, some plants like a cedar wood needs to be distilled for 24 hours. Any really less than that, you're not going to get all the constituents out of it. If you go over 24 hours, you start losing constituents. And at 26 hours, you start, there's no constituents left. So when you think about the average cedar wood in the United States is distilled for less than two hours, that's just an in industry average. And you look at what we do ours at 24 hours that tells you there's something different and there's something we're not just looking to slap a label on a bottle and put it out. If it's not quality, Young Living's not going to put it out, not going to put our name on it. Now, yeah, I was going to ask, I mean, I was going to kind of play devil's advocate because I already know the answer, but, you know, how much of this, what you're talking about, the, the way that Young Living produces their oil, they wait till the perfect time when the chemical constituents are going to be the highest. They distill their plants at the perfect low temperature for the perfect amount of time. How common is that in the industry for other essential oil productions um, companies? And for the other companies that I mean, as far as I know, we're the only essential oil company that owns our own farms. There might be one other, but how does that compare? Where do the other producers get their plants from? And what does that mean from a chemistry perspective about the product that they're going to end up using or producing in the end? I'm sorry, that's like 50 questions in one, but... <laughs> that's... <laughs> well, and I, maybe my answer will be simple because I don't really know a lot about other companies. I've really just kind of become a... I wanted to study the best and Young Living is the world leader. Yes, we have farms all over the world. And so I, I don't know about a lot of others, but I can tell you that Young Living doesn't grow everything ourselves. We do have partners. We have third-party vendors that we purchase oil from, but I can also tell you after speaking with people like Walter Newt, who's um, head of operations at Young Living, Mike Book is um, vice president of research and development. 
those guys, they actually, when we get oil in from other people, we actually turn down a lot of it. And the reason why is because chemically it doesn't match our library of what we know that oil chemically should contain. So when an oil comes in from a third party that is a partner with us, we look at it in our library of what should, you know, it's not going to be exactly the same, um, but there should be a level of range that those oils are in because the oils are exposed to different sun, they're exposed to different water. The soil is going to have a, a little variation over, over the years. And then also making sure that the soil's not depleted. You know, a lot of our partner farms, what Young Living does is we rest our fields. You know, you go through a process where there's, you use the fields for about six years and then there's a break and, on the, and you make sure that those fields are rested too. So the chemistry of the fields are going to differ, but they should always be, the chemistry of that oil should always be in a certain range. And Young Living has actually rejected a lot of oil and that's one reason why we've been out of, out of stock on in a lot of oils because like, a, like for example, Valor, Mm -hmm. And Peace and Calming have black spruce. And when you, our Valor has black spruce and that's why Young Living went and started the Northern Lights Farm. My husband had the opportunity to go up and be a part of building that, that farm up there because we needed black spruce because our supplier was not able to one, get us enough. And then at this, and then the second rate, when we were trying to find it on the market, nothing was coming in, in the, in the ranges that it should and on the chemical ranges that it should. So they, they sell, we reject that oil, but it goes somewhere. Those right. people turn around and sell it somewhere. So I can't tell you who's buying. I don't know what's going on, but I can tell you because we um, have our own farms and because we are very particular, I mean, Young Living could have very easily taken any black spruce off the market, put it in Valor and not lost thousands of maybe millions of dollars because Valor has been out of stock. I'm sure with it, millions. Uh, I mean, yeah, their, exactly. their most popular <laughs> essential oil blend ha had been out of stock for how, like, how many months, you know, oh. and, and yeah. And then there, there's this huge bulk of black spruce that comes on the market. They very easily could have made more Valor, but it would not have been to the quality that their customers expect. So they didn't do it. And, and who would have known? Who would have known? And, you know, I heard Mike Book actually told a story. It was kind of cool. Or maybe it was Walter Newt that told the story that there was actually a third party vendor that was really wanted to be with young, wanted to work with young living because young Living's the best. And whenever he, you know, sent his batch in um, to be tested. And again, it doesn't just go through one test. It's like, I think R&D does at least eight different tests on different machines and different types of chemical tests on just one batch and multiple samples within each individual batch. But this man who was a vendor, he wanted so badly to be a part of Young Living and it was rejected. So he made it his purpose to find out what Young Living was doing, find out from the farms. And they worked with him to tell him, you know, this is what we're looking for. This is what you're do, what we need. And you can't just go into a laboratory and fake that. You know, there's, it's very easy for our chemists to tell synthetics. And so what he did is he worked his tail off and he got it to where now he's, he's a great supplier for Young Living from a third party perspective because he wanted to be the best. He wanted his oil to be Young Living to be using it because he knew Young Living had the highest standard. So that's kind of a cool story of how Seed to Seal has, has brought out the best in some of our vendors as yeah. well. That's so when beautiful. we think about it, yeah, when you think about what Young Living's doing is, you know, a lot of people want to compare it to, to, okay, when we test something and I want the tests and I want to know, I want to see all your tests from Young Living. I want to understand what they mean. And you have to understand that this is really something that's been lost. I mean, the distillation of oils, number one, is kind of, it's been revived since, you know, World War, before World War One in, in France and the story of how it's, it's the revival. If you not know the revival, if anyone's listening doesn't know it, go read about the revival of essential oils and read about the scientists who, I, I have a hard time pronouncing his name, but um, I can spell it for you. Sure. But it was back in, whenever you look at, um, it's Rene Maurice Got to false say G A T T E F O S S and the E with the little accent mark over it. He was actually a French chemist. He badly burned his hand in a laboratory accident, and and that's kind of the revival, the modern day revival of essential oils. But when you start looking at what's going on, the t the technology that we have, and it's continuing to evolve. But Young Living's been doing this for over twenty years, and using people like Dr. Henry Casabianca, like using third party laboratories. And, and Mike book even said, he goes, we don't look for, for laboratories that are 
necessarily good at essential oils. We want laboratories that are unbiased. He said there's one laboratory that they use that's actually a forensic laboratory. And he said that we use them because they're not going to have a bias. They don't have any essential oil history. They've got 50 years of certification with the EPA. They have their analysts. And so he said, you know, if you're looking for a laboratory, if you have a laboratory that you send your oils to and they can turn around a report in a day for hundred dollars, he goes, I would, that would seem to be suspect to me. Mm -hmm. So he goes, you know, a good chemist who's worth his weight is going to do multiple types of testing. They're going to use machines that are calibrated for essential oils, not for perfumes. And then whenever you look at the testing, it should fall within certain ranges. He said, you can find synthetics easily. There's also things, um, you can tell when machines have had, maybe had other things running through them and that creates noise on the bottom it's, and they call it noise, but it's basically all these markers that additional things are in. And it, he said, you can look at some of those and go, what is all this extra information? It's because a, basically a machine hadn't been cleaned properly and they're not taking the time to go through and get all the other chemicals clean it out properly. And so you can get a really good view. So there's so much that goes into it. And Young Living has the most extensive library in the world on all the chemical compounds. There are columns that they found in the GC mass spectrometry, the GCMS, that are new, that Young Living has actually, their scientists have found it. Gary Young has found it. You know, that's something that's unique to us. So when people talk about, well, what do we compare it to? We've got this laboratory testing. What do we look at? Young Living has the most extensive library for any of that because we've been doing it longer than anyone else and we've without the synthetics. So there's so much that goes into the chemistry and it's, I'm just touching, just scratching the surface of what they do in, at Young Living, but the seed to seal process testing is, is a very important process. And Young Living is working on providing more information, more details for it. If you get a chance to, to meet Mike uh, Book or, or Dr. Book or Dr. Kramer, Richard Kramer, um, our great speakers that are always at Young Living Convention, they'll, they have such great insight and knowledge. Yeah. Well, I love that you brought up a lot of things there. And, and I'm glad you brought up getting oils tested just because I think that this, this probably happens, I don't know, occasionally, you know, someone that's not immersed in this culture that has never been to a Young Living Farm, has never heard Gary or any of the founders speak about essential oils that might see that seed to seal slogan and see it as just a slogan and not really the heart of this company, which really has such a huge heart. And at the core of this company is quality. And um, so someone that's not entrenched in that, you know, might occasionally say, well, you know, I'm not sure if I believe this. I'm going to go get my oil sent somewhere, third party tested and, and see if they're really the real deal. But what you're saying is if it's sent to a company that does testing, but maybe lesser quality testing or does a lot of testing for perfume companies or synthetics or other companies, then the machines that they're using, if I understand what you're saying correctly, might have residue left over from those previous tests. So it'd be almost like if you're sending, if you're trying to test for a tea and you send and you put the tea in a coffee pot that hasn't been cleaned out, then there's going to be coffee residue in the tea. So is that what happens sometimes and what causes a lot of the controversy and hoopla that we hear occasionally? Yeah, I think it, it all goes back to trusting your source. Mm -hmm. And so understanding the people who you send, if you really are questioning Young Living's quality, go to a farm. I mean, if you mm -hmm. really, I, I, anybody can put anything out on the internet and say what they want to, can make any kind of accusation without having to be verified. Anybody can have a sounding board, a microphone on the line without having to prove their credibility, without having to say, this is my standpoint. This is what I have, what my experience is. So we don't, the, the labs that people use, there's, there's lots of labs that people can use. So I would say, if you are really interested in challenging Young Living, Young Living has spent thousands upon millions of dollars to, to in this testing process. So when you look at it and you say, okay, well, I want to verify it. Well, you need to make an investment then. And you need to send it to a lab that's doing it right. You need to send it to a forensic lab, like what Mike Book talked about, that's not biased. That's not going to be looking at one essential oil company versus another. They use one called 
chemical technical for it. It's a forensic lab. But like I said, go to find something that's EPA certified, that's not going to be biased, that's not going to have, that has people who are analysts not people who are maybe have an agenda. And also one other thing about when we talk about people in adulteration, Mike Book talked about how difficult it is to adulterate and try to, people try to hide things, you know, and bring things in. I know Young Living had to send out, reject some uh, things before because people were trying to sneak something in. But honestly, it takes a lot more effort and it's much more expensive to adulterate your oil than to actually have the real distillation. Now, granted, we spend a lot of money on the seed to seal process. I mean, it is not an easy process. It's not cheap, but it's pure. But if you wanted to just take, buy a certain oil off the market and adulterate it, it's actually a fairly complicated, expensive process. So Young Living is not in the business of making our process more difficult. We're in the process of making it right. We Mm -hmm. want to have the right oil, the right chemistry. And so when it comes to our testing and our validation, honestly, we kind of hold the library on it. So there's a lot of people that come and one of they, everyone's always saying, well, it's as I've heard some other oil companies say, well, ours is as as good as Young Living's. Well, doesn't that tell you something if they're comparing themselves to you? So having our own farms is really something that sets us apart, but it's also something that makes us very unique in the marketplace because we can experiment too with bringing more oil, bringing more plants in and trying them. For example, a chemotype. I know we were meaning, wanting to talk about this as well, but the chemotype of an oil. So that basically means it's when an oil chemically takes on characteristics of the location where it's grown. So we have our French lavender that originated in France, but when it was planted in Mona, Utah, and it was planted in St. Mary's, Idaho, they're all a little bit different. So that's something pretty unique, but all of those lavenders are still going to fall within a certain range for the specific components, of course, that I can't mention, (laughs) that they should have in those ranges. So an oil, for example, like a sacred frankincense from Oman, that sacred frankincense, now it doesn't, predominantly frankincense grows. There's there's 43 varieties of frankincense that grow in different places. Some are better, better for resin. Some are better for oil. Young Living only has three varieties of frankincense because we feel those are the most valuable. And then Boswellia carteri and Boswellia soccer are the two that we that predominantly we use as oil essential oils. The, the Boswellia feriana is used for resin more commonly. It's good. You find it in your sleek gum and things like that. But the sacred frankincense is very specific to a region of Oman. In fact, it's so specific that you cannot remove the resin out of the country. You have to distill it there in the country. So that's why we have a farm there. We have gone to Oman. Gary Young created a farm there. Sacred frankincense is not the only thing that we distill there, but that's predominantly why is because we wanted the best. And so we made an investment to go in there and do that. Now, that's one thing is you're not going to see that that sacred frankincense, that Boswellia sacra, come from anywhere else but Oman. If it's labeled that way, then that's not just something that the Young Living takes exception with. That's something that the country of Oman and the rulers there take exception with because it's something that's very important to them. They don't allow that resin to leave, so it has to be distilled there. So when you look at those types of things, a, a lavender oil can grow in many different places. It has its, a chemo, its chemotype. It can adjust chemotypes. Sacred frankincense can't. Another example would be Melissa. Young Living has Melissa that grows really well. It grows in high altitude, so it's growing really well up in Highland Flats in our, up in Idaho. Um, it actually grows so well that the altitude helps the, the roots of the of the plant. Actually, there's very there's not as much. Um, weeds that grow. You, they do have to go through and weed it by hand, but as the, as the bush grows stronger, it actually kind of does a really good job of, of almost squeezing out the weeds, I guess, if you would say, but we've tried to grow it in Ecuador. It's not doing as well, even though the altitude is a lot more similar than our other farms in different locations, but it's temperature. So you look at how much hotter it's closer to the equator. So it's not, it's still different. So that may not grow well, but Lang Lang does really well in Ecuador. 
So we have Amazonian langling that came over from Madagascar. It's now it's growing there. So it's it's looking at understanding not just the chemistry of the seed and the plant, but understanding the chemistry of, of what that plant's exposed to. In Ecuador, we could have up to three growing seasons for some for some plants. That's wonderful. In the Highland Flats, we're only gonna get We'll do winter harvest, you know, for our conifers once a year. In the spring, we have to go back through, dig the roots out, replant trees every year. So, and it takes nine to 10, maybe up to 15 years for those plants, for those trees to be ready to be able to be harvested again. So there's such a uniqueness of our business that so much happens and, and depends on chemistry. And we want it, Young Living is, is dedicated through Seed to Seal to do it right. It's not just a, a, a slogan. And anyone that would question that or would have, you know, challenge it, I think asking questions is really good. But if you really are interested in, in solid answers, go visit a farm, go experience a planting, go experience a harvest, visit a distillation and see it firsthand. Mm. Wow, that brings up a lot. But I actually, I want to ask you about something you you were mentioning before about adulteration. And now I'm confused. What's the difference between adulterated oil and synthetic oil? Or is there a difference? Yeah, there is a difference. So a synthetic is basically something that was manufactured in a laboratory. Like I said earlier, our essential oils have carbons, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen. So you can take that structure. That's what pharmaceuticals do. They look at a lot of pharmaceuticals started as plants. They looked at the chemical makeup of a plant and then they tried to manufacture it in a laboratory chemically. Because that's a lot cheaper. Yes. It's a lot cheaper and you can patent that. So you can patent a medicine because then what they do is they take that that structure and you you have like water's H2O, right? Well, is OH2 water? No, it's not because it's the structure that matters. So symbiotically, your body understands water's H2O. Chemically, it, it works with your body. But if you start messing with the structure, your body's like, whoa, what is this? And now you have side effects. So that's the difference between a pharmaceutical and a plant when it comes to chemical structure. And so that's, that's synthetic. That's in a lab. So what happens in the body? What's the difference between a synthetic and a, and a authentic essential oil as far as like peppermint, a synthetic peppermint, what's that going to do to your body versus an authentic peppermint? Well, and it just depends on, on the structure Mm -hmm. of that peppermint because, you know, just synthetically, what does it have? Does it have the right amounts of what it's supposed to or not? But whenever you look at the real peppermint, your body is going to use that Three different people might use peppermint oil and three different people might have different experiences with peppermint oil, but it, their body recognizes the natural structure of that and the natural chemistry of that. Whereas with a synthetic, it goes in and acts like a robot. So it's those three same people should have, they should experience exactly the same experience, exactly the same thing from that synthetic, like a a medicine. If you have high blood pressure and you three people with high blood pressure, they take high blood pressure medicine, it's gonna lower their blood pressure, right? So that's the only job. So if you have someone with low blood pressure that takes that high blood pressure medicine, it's gonna lower it even further. Whereas an, an oil that's natural, it's going to know what your body needs. It's not going to go in and say, okay, well, I have to, the, the oil's living, it's just living nature. So it's chemically adapting into your body what your body needs, not just, I'm a robot, I'm gonna go in and mm. do this one thing. So when an oil goes in, the oil is adjusting appropriately. And so the oil is, is living, the, your body is living, and it's, the chemicals and the molecules are interacting in a way that's symbiotic. Whereas, like I said earlier, a synthetic pharmaceutical is going to go in and just do one thing. So adulterated, adulterated oil, the difference is it started as maybe plants, but then other things were added to it to try to make it, for example, a lot of times people smell peppermint and it doesn't smell like a peppermint extract. Cause most people, it's like, what does the market want? They want the smell. They want to, sometimes our peppermint, our peppermint smells different sometimes from different harvest to different harvest, depending on exactly the sun and the rain and everything. Some people have even said, oh, there's something wrong with this. It smells different, but Young Living doesn't go off the smell. They go off of the markers. They go off the testing. And if it's in the right ranges, then it's going to be fine. So you have to go back at that adulterated oil and think, why are they adding things to it? Why are they extending it? Well, a lot of time it's cost. It's to make a better, a cheaper product. It's to make more of that product to be able to have a higher 
yield so you can sell more. So synthetic and adulteration are really not either one. I would give one drop of pure oil. I'd rather have one drop of pure than gallons of, of the adulterator, the synthetic stuff, because it's not doing naturally what it needs to do. So again, it goes back to synthetic and adulteration, in my opinion, are just, that's marketplace. Those are there because people are entrepreneurs and they're, it's all about profit. Right. Well, and it's not that they're, you know, evil and trying to, to poison everyone. It's just what the, what the people want. You know, people want cheap essential oils, not realizing that a pure essential oil has the ability to do so much good for you. You know, most people that start using essential oils really just want to smell good. And that's what I tell people. I said, if you just want to use essential oils to smell good for perfume, for, you know, making your own candles, yeah, I'd prefer you to use an authentic oil because it's better for the earth, better for your body. You're not going to expose yourself to, you know, synthetic, potentially harmful side effects. But Yes, uh, an authentic oil is much more expensive. So if you just want the smell, you know, get the cheap stuff. But if you want it to do something for your body, that's a totally different category. Well, and I would say, you know, I'm not saying people are, I'm sorry if I implied that people were intentionally evil or deceitful, but I do really strongly believe that the way that our bodies make up, that it can be very dangerous. Just studying the chemistry of it, when you inhale an oil, it's going into your it's going into your limbic system through your olfactory, your limbic, your central brain. You're inhaling an oil. And to me, I put an oil on my skin, my largest organ. I better be able to eat that oil. I better be able to inhale that oil because I'm exposing it to my body. So personally, I'm not going to even buy a cheap oil for the smell because honestly, drop per drop, and I do a I do a class called the Economics of Healthy Living, drop per drop your oils are incredibly economic because yeah. you don't need as much. So if you have something that's pure, if you have it's pure and it's solid, like what we have in Seed to Seal, if you're diffusing it or if you're putting it in your food or if you're putting it on your children, it's the same exact plant every time. And so you know what you're getting. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's safe. It's the safest way to use the oils and it's the safest way to purchase the oils. And honestly, the most economical way as well. Absolutely. Oh man, I wish I could talk here for another hour with you and <laughs> we could easily go on. <laughs> we I know I got to go pick up my kids from daycare. Like, but, um, but we do always like to leave our listeners with a few closing questions. So if you don't mind sharing, Laura, do you have just real quick, a, a personal um, healthy routine or healthy habits that you do every day? Well, absolutely. And I think because of my daughter, I'm challenged with that, but we do um, shot glasses. We do a shot glass of Ningxia every day. And then we add a few oils to it. My daughter likes to set them up, nice. <laughs> if you will. She doesn't know what shot glasses are really for. And I'm going to let that, <laughs> let that stay, but she actually has a collection when she, we go and visit places that she buys her own, she takes her own money and buys so I get some funny looks, but <laughs> anyways, um, but we, we do Ningxia Red every day. We, uh, we love Ningxia Nitro, adding that to our routine. I use a variety of oils. People say, Woo, what do you smell like? And I'm like, there's just no talent because some of my favorite oils are stress away. I love to put frankincense on my scalp. I love to use citrus oils. Um, I love the lemon vitality, the jade lemon vitality, the orange vitality, drinking those. Um, I love to use peppermint on my wrist before I work out um, every day. So those are specific things we're you know, definitely using. We're cleaning. I couldn't live a day without, I've got thieves soap at every single one of my sinks and using, of course, the lavender shampoos whenever we, when we shower. So, I mean, honestly, I am it's constant. There's not just any one thing that I do, but I honestly, one of the things that I love to do before, like for, before this call today, I put vetiver and sacred frankincense on. I believe that it, the aromas of those just help me stay focused. And I love to use those. And then any of the Ula oils, we mentioned Ula briefly. If you're trying specifically for goals in your life that you want to focus on, I highly recommend the Ula oils in the Ula book. They're, mm -hmm. they're just phenomenal. And finally, Laura, what's just one thing we should all ditch completely and replace with something healthier today? Oh, so if you had to start somewhere, I think the first thing that I would do is go under your kitchen cabinet and go into your, you know, where your cleaning supplies are and start with that. The thieves cleaner is one easy thing to replace every other cleaner in your home. I, it's the only other cleaner that I use, you know, thieves, yeah, young living has put out the thieves, the thieves dish soap and the thieves detergent, but I've used thieves cleaner by itself for 
any household activity. And so that would be a, a, a number one thing is getting those chemicals out. If you have something that you have to use a safety lock for in your home, that would be, that tells you right there, you don't, you don't want it. If you don't want your kids exposed to it, you shouldn't be exposing yourself to it either. And it goes back to, you know, when you clean with something, if you're not wearing gloves, if you're not wearing a mask, you know, it's getting into your, you're, you're breathing it in, you're putting it on your skin, it's being absorbed. You might not be drinking it, but you're exposing your body to it. So I would say getting chemicals, getting chemical toxins out of your home. Melissa Pepping has a great book on um, a toxic free chemical home that people can start making their own specific recipes, but just starting with the thieves clean is a great way, I think, to start making a big change. Well, awesome, Laura. So, well, we want to say goodbye, but before you go, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you or learn more about what you've got going on? I feel like we didn't even talk about Thrive In City at all. So uh, real quickly, <laughs> what, what is Thrive In City all about and how can people learn more about you or get in touch? Sure. Well, Thrive in City is, is just a blog that I kind of created with some of my classes that I've taught, uh, thriveincity.com. That's Thrive nsity.com. And honestly, it's just it's in free information. So anyone can go out and learn and read the information I put out there from everything from skincare products to using oils with babies. And like I said, there's a class called the economics of healthy living out there. And if you're interested in the business side of young living, there's a whole tab called leadership. So thrive Insity, my husband said, because we want to help people thrive in life, but he's, he feels that I'm one of the words that best describes me <laughs> is intense. So th- thrive and intense came together to thrive in city. So intensity. So the whole point of it is go out there. You can at thriveincity.com and you can download stuff. You can read stuff. We actually have a Facebook page that people can follow just easily. I do a lot of classes one-on-one, you know, in front of people. And so this was kind of an easier way for me to be able to share with people, you know, a little easier. People can just listen to the classes whenever they want to at their convenience. And so, and of course I'll be speaking at the Young Living Convention this year. And so if you get a chance to, to come to that, I don't know if, I think it's already full, but Hopefully there'll be opening up more seats in, in all of those classes. I'm going to be teaching about the compensation plan and accelerating earnings. And of course, talking about Road to Royal a little bit as well, too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Laura. It's been such a delight having you here. I'll be sure to put the links for all of your, your website and other ways for people to connect and some of the resources on the show notes for this page, uh, for this episode can be at revolutionoils.com. Easy to find there. So we'll say goodbye, Laura. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Thank you for having me, Samantha. It was wonderful. Well, folks, thanks again for listening to another great episode of the Essential Oil Revolution. If you were really interested in this topic of chemistry and essential oils, there's two books that I wanted to recommend to you where you can learn a lot more. The first is the classic Chemistry of Essential Oils Made Simple by Dr. David Stewart. And the other one is The Chemistry of Essential Oils Made Even Simpler by Michelle Truman. So those two books are definitely your go-to if you want to learn more about the chemistry behind essential oils, which I learned so much just from this one interview with Laura, and I really want to learn more. You can find the notes again for this episode at revolutionoils.com forward slash intro to chemistry. And hey, thanks everyone who gave their awesome feedback on the Facebook page recently. So if you haven't found the Essential Oil Revolution podcast uh, Facebook page, you can go there and check out the conversation we've been having going on. There's a pinned post actually at the top about, I wanted your feedback on designing the perfect essential oil shelf. So I've recently teamed up with Ox Woodwork, who does amazing handcrafted, beautiful woodwork. And uh, we are in the works of designing the perfect essential oil shelf. And you guys have given amazing ideas and feedback. So please continue that conversation there, or you can join the email list. If you go to revolutionoils.com forward slash connect and join the email list, because I'm not sure when it's going to be, but when we do finally produce these oil shelves, the people that are on the newsletter are going to be the first to be able to purchase because they're going to be coming out in very limited, very small batches. So if you want the first dibs on these oil shelves that are going to be just amazing, then make sure you are on the newsletter at revolutionoils.com forward slash connect. 
Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. Keep on learning, keep on discovering, and most importantly, keep on treating yourself well. You are worth it.